as a number, but they also come with a measure of uncertainty. So that's important to note that uh, you know whenever you're looking at these uh, uh, FPKM values, that they are not uh, etched in stone; they are sort of fuzzy. Uh, fortunately, Kuffling's differential, you know, Kuff diff takes that statistic into consideration as it uh, decides which ones are differentially expressed. So this is what it's showing here. So once you select your counts for a given isoform, you then start to model exactly that uncertainty for the, uh, for the abundance. Then you can start condition, you know, compare your two conditions. And uh, from these two distributions per gene or isoform, you can then derive a full change, a p-value, and then an FDA, uh, a false discovery rate adjusted um, um, value. Um, and that's really all I really wanted to give you as, as, the, as the basics for analysis. I wanted to point out that uh, we are still on track to hopefully release some uh, uh, version 2 RNA-seq apps that will have much more granularity uh, available to you. We're going to have an additional fusion gene color in, 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 the, in the form of Manta. Um, we are, we, you can much better match between your aligner and your, your uh, differential expression color, so you can do top hat alignment and DE seq to uh, uh, differential expression. Um, we have going to have support for multiple case control studies with cufflinks and paired replicates, so you can do two normal analysis between multiple patients. Uh, that's probably pretty powerful uh, analysis as well. Uh, and we're going to bump up the uh, number of available uh, reference genomes now, including uh, cow, pig. Drosophila, zebrafish, elegans, corn rice, Arabidopsis, and Saccharomyces. So right now it's just human mouse rat, but uh, hopefully by the end of the year we will have uh, these additional uh, or, or reference genomes available as well. Can I ask a question? Yes. How do you guys do the star mantle fusion Um, You might have to talk to somebody who actually uh, uh, worked on the algorithm. I, okay. think, uh, okay. I think Manta might actually be kind of published. Um, yeah, and I think it was part of one of those uh, dream challenges and stuff. But yeah. uh, I actually don't know where the actual description of the algorithm lives. Okay, cool. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, it might actually be on GitHub. Um, I, I think I, I dropped the uh, page where we say that we have Isaac two and Manta <coughs> on a GitHub page. So that might be a good start as well. Okay, cool. Thank you. All right. Um, Using base space to analyze RNA-seq data. This is what I want us to do, but I, we, we might not get to it because I'm already half an hour into my, uh, well, we'll see how far we get. So if I uh, can have everybody uh, essentially type in this URL, uh, or you can run it if we have. Uh, uh, it should work as well. But if it doesn't, you can, uh, you know, it's human readable, so you can actually type this yourself. I even uh, changed the font to uh, uh, a courier. So that the uh, difference between capital uh, I's and uh, L's are actually uh, readable. I have a couple of URLs where this is the case, and we could never decide if it's an I or an L. So, uh, so this is uh, you know, G O O dot G L, little Q capital D H M seven O, and I think the uh, um, URL. Actually, no, this is the only place where I have it. I wonder if I need to write it down. Um, anybody? Who has, and of course, don't type this into your uh, Google uh, search engine. It has to go straight into your, um, what's it called, browser, browser bar on top. I can put the link on the course link in case anyone gets lost in the content. As I said, I mean, you do have it in your, in your, in your PDF, uh, and uh, I'm gonna have to move on now from here. Let me see if I can grab that. So if I can ask you to uh, let's see, where's my uh, um, window? So you just essentially put this one up here. And uh, if you have, if you don't have a base space account, uh, you would have to now register. The challenge is that you would have to wait for an email address to come back, and you have to acknowledge before you can actually start to do this. Uh, I I forgot to uh, you know ask you to start doing this before we. Uh, uh, before we started, so um, you might be a, you know, a little bit busy of uh, setting up your base base accounts while I continue. Um, 
what's what's typically important is that uh, this is uh, you know you, you can share projects between uh, uh, collaborators quite nicely. Uh, the challenge is that you cannot do any analysis in this project because you're not the owner of the project. So in order for you to do any analysis in base space, the first thing you always have to do and uh, is to actually create a project that you are the owner of. And uh, actually, you know what? I'm in my person and my corporate email address. I'm just going to switch over to my personal account. All righty. And as you actually noticed here, my storage bar heavily now moved over from the data that I own versus the data that I accepted as shared. And that's the part that you're not responsible, going to be responsible for paying for. It's only that little, little green bar that uh, ultimately we're going to charge you for. So again, the first thing that you want to do is, uh, uh, and actually I'm just going to, since I did this just yesterday, just move this to the trash. And now I'm going to, first thing I do, new project. So this is when you're in the project tab of BaseSpace. What you want to do first is hit new project. And again, this one I'm going to do RNA workshop. Create. Now you created uh, uh, essentially a target directory where you can copy data into. Um, now the, uh, the shared project that you essentially just uh, accepted is called RNA seek. And it has those two dots in front of the name just so that when I sort uh, by alphabet, it pops up right away to the top. So this is the only reason why it's named like this. Um, so what I want you to go is into samples uh, in that shared project. Remember, this is the project I shared with you uh, or that you accepted by with that URL. And uh, my biggest pet peeve, copying only shows up once you select those samples. So you select your samples. And now you can copy it to the project that you just generated. So there's my RNA workshop project. And I think uh, I have to erase this one. Let me see, does it have anything in it? Oh no, it's the new one. Okay, cool. Uh, I just wasn't sure if this was my old one that had already samples in it. <coughs> anyway, samples, you select them. And then you can copy them into the project that you just uh, generated. Okay? So now, in order to get started on BaseSpace and actually kick off an analysis, you would have to go into your own project. And you have two choices really how to start an app. One is you can go into the Apps tab and see a collection of all the apps, which versions are there. You can see description, limitations, and each app is essentially being described. Or you can stay in the project that you want to be working on and use a little rocket ship launcher right here uh, and start uh, looking for the uh, app that you want to trigger from within the project. Uh, so you can go uh, and uh, what I want you to do is actually launch RNA Express. Uh, so we can go down and uh, scroll down uh, looking for R, RNA Express. Um, okay, so, so far, I mean, how many people have I lost already? Uh, one, two, three. Uh, where are where, 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 where you stuck? How far did you get? You just trying to get the login though. Yeah. 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 <laughs> All right. That's I should have yeah I should have tried to do this be, uh, before and we would have had that one out of the way. Um, do you want me to come back later once you have that uh, uh, done or? Uh, yeah, I guess just. Uh, yeah, let's keep, let's keep going. We'll do the same, th similar things again for the uh, RNA and metagenomics apps. Uh, so you can you can get another chance of uh, messing around uh, in base space that way. Anyway, so we're triggering the app with the uh, uh, with the with the rock, rocket uh, launcher, uh, RNA Express, and because we triggered it from within the project, uh, this is already pre-populated, so you don't have to choose where your data needs to go to. Um, these are the different uh, references right now. Two different humans. Uh, one mouse, one rat, uh, and uh, because we're using, uh, so I haven't even told you what these samples are. One is a brain sample. It's the same as the MacQC samples, brain versus universal human reference, which is a mixture of uh, cancer genes, uh, cancer gene, uh, uh, cancer cell lines. Um, so that's UHR. Um, we used uh, RNA access to process these samples. They're heavily downsampled. It's only two and a half million clusters per sample. 
um, but that's good enough to show some of the features of the, of the analysis. So we have, uh, uh, RNA access is stranded, so we're going to keep this radio button on. Uh, RNA Express does everything from beginning to finish, so you already have to specify which samples are uh, your treatment and control group. So my control, I typically make UHR, uh, then I go to select samples, and here are my uh, four samples that I just copied into this project. If you did not copy these samples into your own project, now, it's not a problem, they just don't, they're not going to show up here. You can always go in project, find the one that I shared with you, which is, again, this RNA-seq, RNA-access, brain versus UHR. And there again, there are the same samples available as well. So you can grab samples from a different project anywhere in your own account, but uh, logistically it's just ne neater if you keep your samples and your analysis results in the same project. So again, with grabbing UHR, UHR, Confirm, and uh, the same is uh, not UNR. Uh, and then we can do the brain group here. Uh, select the samples, again, brain two, brain one, uh, confirm. And that's really the uh, starting point. Uh, you can edit the uh, app session name, anything you want to, because underlying all of these uh, base space are unique uh, numerical identifier that's simply being mapped to different names uh, and, and uh, descriptors. All right, so as you're pressing this uh, uh, go button, the, the blue air forward error, uh, all the things that you had to do manually uh, by booting up a compute node uh, in Amazon Cloud, all this is happening automatically now. Uh, the data is being copied over uh, from uh, Amazon S3 into the Elastic Cloud. And obviously the compute node is already pre-configured to do an RNA ex uh, express analysis. And all of this is really happening without you having to do anything except push, push a button. Um, the next thing that I want to show you uh, is how, uh, the slightly unique aspect of launching uh, a top hat. So there's launching up, we can, we can launch the app again. And uh, look for top hat. Top Hat alignment. Uh, so here the difference now is that because Top Hat does alignment of, of all of your samples, you have to select all of your, all four samples together because you don't have to decide which group uh, they belong into. So we're selecting all four samples. Again, they are stranded. Uh, we're going to keep the same uh, reference. And the only option really that you have to make a decision if you want to call fusion genes or not because our result file will have fusion genes called. We're just going to select that. And again, hit continue, and all of the magic is happening behind the scenes without you having to worry about anything. What I wanted to point out, though, is that the uh, um, uh, uh, Top Hat is a multi-node uh, app. What that means is that for every sample that you submit, one compute, a dedicated compute node is being booted up in Amazon Cloud. So your analysis is not going sequential, it's going parallel. So the half, you know, your app is going to be done when your last sample is being finished. So instead of having to wait for four samples, you have to just wait for your slowest sample. Which is not great, you know, not a great uh, improvement over four samples, but imagine if you wanted to do 96 uh, uh, alignments, uh, by with one click of a button, you're booting up 96 uh, different compute nodes. Uh, in Amazon Cloud. All right, so uh, now we're going to switch to a slightly different way of how to grab samples from uh, from a different project. Yes, question. When you're launching an application, uh -huh. do you need to be in that project. To I mean, you, you, you need to first click to make sure that we're in the RNA workshop project before we start. Launching. It makes it easier okay. because now it's pretty populated. If you launch it from within the app uh, 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 page, this part is empty and you have to specify where the data needs to go. So the default would be the output would be within this sort of Correct. project. Correct. You can still override this. You can still override it, I think, from the blue bar and uh, choosing any other project you want to. Uh, it's just a convenient thing of starting a problem within the project. So now that we're, we started Top Hat, obviously Top Hat isn't finished yet, but what we, you know, in order to start cufflinks, you have to have top hat results. So again, if we're now looking for cufflinks, uh, we can, uh, it's pre-populated already, as we're grabbing app results, there's nothing in our project, right? Because top hat hasn't finished yet. 
but as exactly the same way that I showed you earlier that you can uh, find your samples in other projects, the same you can do here, find my shared project, and here are the, the top hat results that were pre-populated, you know, just in like any good cooking show, you know, here are the ingredients and voila, here's the finished dish. There's the app results, you just grab your two UHR samples for that group, confirm, call this one UHR as well, and call this one brain, empty if I click the blue button first, because nothing is in this project, switch over, grab brain, brain, and done. And again, the only thing that uh, is, is user intervention, actually there's two things that, have, that uh, allow you to do some user intervention. One is you can decide if you want to do novel transcript assembly, which we will we decide on. And the other aspect is that the Cufflinks algorithm uh, can be told if you use total RNA-seq data or something else. So if you're using total RNA-seq, you want to select this radio button uh, essentially telling it that if it finds intronic sequences to essentially start ignoring them uh, during the, the novel, novel transcript discovery just because total RNA-seq has more of them and you don't want your the Bruin graph to make new isoforms for every new uh, intronic reads that it finds. All right, and again, we just hit continue. Uh, I'm just going to not do this now, but uh, I, you know, you can you can certainly uh, do that. And uh, off we go, and we have essentially you're doing RNA Express in parallel with top hat cufflinks, and uh, you know you you started the process in five minutes. Um, the other thing that I wanted to point out is this is when you are in your own project. This is also where you can have your tools to do uh, uh, sharing, and uh, you know manipulating this project. You can uh, import legacy data into, into base space that way. So again, you have to have first a, a project that you own. Then you can import FASTQ files. You can import VCF files. So as you're trying to, you know, if you have a fantastic uh, a variant calling pipeline that Brad perhaps uh, provided, you can upload that VCF file to base space and compare to uh, what base space is producing. Um, we have some uh, VCF overlapping tools uh, calculator in there, but uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure his, his stuff is going to be better. <laughs> um, anyways, if you're doing targeted resequencing, uh, there's manifests uh, uh, that you can upload that way as well. Um, if you want to share a project with a collaborator that you know the email address of, you click here, simply type in the email address, and they get an email saying, hey, somebody wants to share the project with you. You know, just click on this link. Uh, not sure, what, okay, cancel. If you want to do anonymous sharing, well, semi-anonymous, but if you don't know the person that you want to share a project with, you essentially create uh, a sharing link through this feature, and anytime anybody who, uh, who uh, essentially clicks on this link or pastes this into, the, into their browser gets access to the project. That's the mechanism that we're using for, for the demo data. Um, transfer ownership, anybody who's uh, in the sequencing core and they just want to have nothing to do with the data, just want to get it off their hands, you can simply transfer ownership of projects as well. That's also the way that if your sequencing core sequences the samples of multiple users, they simply generate multiple projects, pop, uh, copy the data into different projects, and simply transfer ownership of them to their respective uh, customers. Uh, obviously, when you're done with a project, you don't need any more, move to trash is, is, a, is definitely a possibility. It's a two-step process. It goes into the trash bin. It's only gone once you empty the trash bin. You can get always get it back from the trash can. Um, all right, so this is RNA, you know, seek analysis, kicking off the analysis. Let's have a quick look at some of the results. Um, so RNA Express, um, it generates the usual suspects of, uh, of, of benchmarks. You know, you see generic uh, sample descriptions. Um, you get, uh, uh, you know, what I just want to point out is that uh, how many reads in this particular sample span splice junction. This is RNA access data. so. Over 30% of all reads span at least one splice junction, very useful. You're getting all your links to the BAM files, so if you wanted to do some sort of local visualization or other tools, you don't, you know, you want to do something after just mapping, you can grab the BAM files from right here. You can grab all of the output files are in the output files directory, and you can download that one uh, in bulk as well. 
Um, this is already the list where you have your differential gene expression. 23,000 are in the RefSeq. 12,000 have some coverage that you can uh, measure their expression. Uh, remember, it's highly downsampled. Uh, and uh, 8,500 are differentially expressed. Uh, again, this is a very artificial system. Uh, and uh, having a large portion differentially expressed is not a big surprise with this uh, artificial system. Um, I wanted to just point out, uh, you can get uh, a link to this, uh, to this file and uh, let me just show you how this looks like. Uh, this is the most raw output file that RNAexpress produces, simply 23,000 gene names, four, target, uh, four samples, and then how many, mess uh, how many reads map to that gene. Uh, it's not normalized, it just strictly counts, uh, nothing else there. Uh, let me go into uh, the results. This one now uh, contains the results of DEC2, normalized data, um, and uh, um, uh, so a, log, uh, a, a base mean, which is just an average uh, of, the, of all the samples, a full change between the groups, uh, a measure of how variable these, uh, this uh, log full change is, a p-value, a q-value, and a status. And I just wanted to uh, show you one, uh, one gene, which is PARC7, and nothing is happening here. It's not differentially expressed. I just wanted you to keep this in mind that going RNA express route in PARC7, nothing to see here. It's uh, you know, not, a, not interesting at all. Um, the other aspect that uh, is pretty useful from RNA Express is that it does an unsupervised clustering of all of your samples. So if you need to do some sort of quick QC check and say that all of your biological replicates fall into the same group, that's a great way of doing this. Uh, obviously all of your replicates have to be clustering nicely together, which they are in this case. Um, you can also quickly look at, let me step back. If you have single cell data where you actually don't know what your groups are, you're trying to identify what are your subpopulations of cells, you can actually use unsupervised clustering to find populations of, of cells that sort of look similar. Uh, and then you can do a second round of differential gene expression and actually do those particular cell samples against other cell samples that you're trying to figure out what's the, what's the expression difference between those two groups. Um, so there you would essentially submit all of your samples to RNA Express, uh, do look at the uh, cluster, uh, and then try to figure out what are your different subpopulations in, in, your, in your sequenced cells. Um, so then uh, we also have this interactive uh, um, result browser essentially. You can uh, click on any one of these blue dots, and uh, down here in, the, uh, in this uh, table, that gene shows up, uh, tells you exactly what its expression level is, the full change, skew value, etc. So if you are interested in a particular gene, you want to say, like, well, do, how do all of my heat shock proteins are doing? So you can do actually some search uh, and then poke as well. So it's, it's really not a great uh, 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 discovery tool, but if you just simply wanted to get a quick look uh, how this particular result, uh, uh, experiment worked, you have particular genes that you keep, try to keep track of, uh, this interactive browser is a great way to start. Any question about RNA Express? No. All right, let's move on to Top Hat. All right, so again, remember, this is uh, just mapping four samples to, to the reference. Uh, the more interesting results uh, are actually in the individual samples, but I just wanted to point out that the summary actually calculates percent strandedness, so that's a unique aspect of Top Hat. It actually tells you how many of your reads are properly aligned relative to your gene orientation. That's a good QC metric if you wanted to know how good your library prep preserves stranded information. Um, it also shows you very uh, 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 detailed uh, insert size distribution. Again, another QC metric if you wanted to find out if you have outliers in your data, things, samples that didn't perform properly. Uh, that would be a, a great way to start at an inter-site distribution. Um, if you're now going into an individual sample, you're getting uh, much more detailed information, you're getting uh, 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 variant calls, you know, how many variant calls were made in this particular sample. Again, it's heavily downsampled, so you're not getting a lot of them. Um, but right here at the bottom, you're getting a lot of links to useful uh, uh, files that are all in output files directory, but they're in many different subdirectories. So here we collected the most important ones uh, in one uh, place, the, the BAM files, 
uh, uh, bed files for the coverage, FPKM values on the gene level, FPKM value on the transcript level, uh, a link to the VCF files, which is the variant call file, and uh, I just want to show you the top hat fusion output because it's just too damn cool. Um, I just clicked on this link. Uh, it shows me that essentially BCR able was found. I mean, it's cancer cell line, so no surprise. But the really neat thing is if you click on some of those hyperlinks, it shows you every single read that is either near or is spanning the fusion gene event. So you can get a pretty detailed uh, uh, output for your fusion gene event and then you can uh, as, a, as a researcher interrogate how reliable that evidence is if it's, this is a real fusion event. Um, so a lot of people who are looking for fusions really are geared towards doing this in RNA-seq data as compared to genomic data. Um, and uh, just as, a, uh, as an addition, we also keep track of how many reads span the fusion gene event without actually covering the uh, fusion junction. That's essentially uh, how, how many uh, paired end reads uh, coming, you know. The, uh, the, the fusion event is in the unknown portion of the fragment. All right, um, yeah, this is pretty much top hat. Um, let's see, cufflinks. Uh, Can I ask a question? Yes, if absolutely. you wanted to download, I mean, to, to the, the, the AM file, some kind of back on your AM file, mm -hmm. file or is there an option to download it not to the computer where you're looking at, but download it somewhere else? Um, so if you're going here in the output files directory, there's download analysis, right? Uh, you actually have the option of only downloading VCF files, only about downloading BAM files, and as you're setting this one up, you specify where you want this to be downloaded. So you have to actually, you, you can specify any target directory where you want it, where this want to go. Uh, so obviously it only can go uh, to any, but any, any place in your uh, uh, locally mapped uh, uh, network drive. So it could go to a uh, mapped network drive on your local computer. So you just have to specify where the download directory is. And it does make a subdirectory with the name of the analysis in it, so you don't have to make, uh, 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 for every analysis, an automatic directory is already being generated. You don't have to specify per analysis. And the name of that will be the name that you gave your, your, your project? Um, I think there's even a, a date tag. I mean, there's, there's, there's some unique uh, 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 portion of that name is always going to be there so that uh, you can just keep on adding to the same directory without over, uh, overriding anything. But, you know, as you're, as you're needing more of that interaction with base space, it's probably going to start becomes more, uh, more interesting to actually install base mount, and then you have the entire directory structure of base space available as your local, uh, as, a, as a local local directory as well. So then you don't need the downloader. All right, cufflinks report. Uh, the nice thing is it keeps track of the samples that we used as the input. It also keeps track of the ingoing FPKM tables for genes and transcripts. Because we use the Novo assembly, we're getting this entire assembly direct uh, uh, table uh, where we are showing how many novel transcripts uh, or potentially novel transcripts were found. Everything is then being rolled into these uh, differential expression calculation. Of course, now the gene count is increased because we uh, uh, chose to have assembly happening. Uh, and then here you see the, the, the list of differentially expressed uh, genes and transcripts. Um, again, if you're looking at the, uh, uh, at, at the true results, um, and this is always wonderful because it has diff as its extension, so it's great to connect it to Excel, which doesn't know that. Um, and uh, if I can show you Park 7, if you're doing gene level analysis, Q value is 0.38, nothing here. Uh, so by all, by all means, PARC7 is not differentially expressed. Now if I go however, and I'm sure you realize that there's a however, uh, if you're opening up the uh, uh, differentially transcript level analysis uh, output file, uh, you will see that uh, PARC7 actually contains two isoforms, and as it so happens, they're both expressed in opposite direction. So as you're rolling all of your read counts together, this difference is being essentially washed out, 
uh, one is up, one is down. Both of them are statistically significant. And uh, you essentially found differentially expressed isoforms that counteract each other. Uh, and uh, as you're looking into more uh, um, proteins that might have regulatory roles, having a domain, not having a domain, truly can have opposing outcomes uh, on a functional level. So it's really important to uh, look at this level of detail if, if you're looking for uh, you know, in differential spliced isoforms. Um, but what does it mean? I mean, I want to see the results. Uh, you know, how do these different isoforms really differ from each other? And this is where another app uh, in, uh, in BaseSpace comes in really handy, which is called IGV, which is the Integrated Genome Viewer, which I'm sure you've used already uh, uh, in your work previously in this week. So we're looking for the Integrated Genome Viewer app. Um, the nice thing about it is, I mean, there's a bad thing about it because it's Java-based and uh, sometimes Java works great on, on computers, security-wise, and sometimes it's, it's an absolute nightmare trying to get a Java executable to execute um, because of the security settings. So let's see how this goes. I'm gonna have to start this up, go back here. Um, let's see, where's my show and finder. I have to start it again, open with Java web start. Now it lets me open it. Um, all right. So now I'm running the Java local Java applet on, on, on my computer. And the first thing that you're going to see is uh, an interactive window that asks what data tracks you want to upload. And because we triggered it from within your uh, from within this project. You're only seeing the results from this project. So there's the, there's the name of the project. Here are the different uh, analysis that were done, and we're looking for the top hat analysis. In top hats are our four samples, two brain, two UHR, and all I want you to do is essentially, whoever is still on board, um, a Buddha, uh, essentially uh, bring in one brain and one UHR sample. So there's the BAM file for the brain, double click. Uh, then I'm opening up the uh, UHR. Again, I'm looking for the BAM file. Double click and close. So now both, you know, I, I don't see anything here because we're zoomed out to whole genome view. But uh, if we're now going to Park 7, um, you noticed here on the bottom is the, uh, is the, uh, um, the exon list. The exon list. Um, I can, let me see, where is this one? Squish. Some of these reads, we don't need to see them um, uh, individually. But as I'm hovering over these reads, and that's the important portion, you can't, your mouse can't be here, there, or anywhere there. It has to be over one of those reads. Right click gets you into this uh, visualization option menu. And we're looking essentially for sashimi plots. Um, sashimi plot, I'm saying like, yes, that I want, those, I want to visualize those two samples. And this is where the really uh, uh, the most informative uh, in the differential splicing information uh, that I've ever found, uh, the sashimi plots are really at the top of the list. So we're looking at the two isoforms of PARC7. If you look very closely, right here in the very beginning, there's two exons, and I'm going to zoom in a little bit more. Um, <coughs> that uh, are slightly different in length. Hopefully you can all see that. Um, and uh, the nice thing about sashimi plot is it blocks out all of the noise, all of the reads that just uh, map to the whole exome. It simply counts how many splice junction are covered by, by reads uh, in this data set. And uh, if you notice, so brain versus UHR, the long isoform connects to exon 2 uh, with 90, uh, 69 reads uh, in, in the brain sample, but only 37 reads in the uh, UHR sample. But the short isoform is the opposite. So 48 reads connect the short isoform with exon 2, and 96 uh, the, the other exon. So sashimi plots is, is, is really the only way to, to go from an abstract isoform number to an understanding what's going on in your data set. Uh, and of course, I found a very simple uh, example. But uh, as you start using different isoforms, you know, these sashimi plots can start getting pretty pretty brutal, uh, messy. But it at least gives you a chance to understand or visualize what's going on. All right, and I think, uh, actually I have 
couple more things uh, in regards to RNA ex uh, RNA seq uh, results, um, especially as you are working. Um, you know, most of you are not in the business of just simply generating differentially expressed results. You want to know what it means biologically. We do have a couple uh, a couple of uh, uh, apps available that will help you with that. And let me go back into this project. One is Next Bio Research. So Next Bio Research is a so Illumina purchased Next Bio maybe two years ago, and it's essentially a massive correlation engine. It has a lot of uh, publicly available data sets already pre-populated. So if you wanted to know how your data set compares to, let's say, for instance, the geo, the, the genome, uh, not browser, uh, ex expression omnibus, um, all of this data is already available in NextBio. But the real value of NextBio research comes into play that if you are already sitting on a, uh, on a mountain of gene expression array data, you can upload that data into your own NextBio account and now starting to correlate your own uh, RNA-seq data to your uh, legacy uh, expression data. So I think this is a, a one platform that uh, should allow you, as soon as possible, to transition from uh, uh, arrays to RNA-seq without losing the information that is in your arrays. Um, anyway, so uh, I just want, you know, so you submit your, um, your results to your next bio account. I'm just gonna quickly log in to just give you an idea how this how this looks like um, okay. waiting for enterprise there we go um, so it does a lot of automatic uh, what's new where's my data set where's my data set There's my data set. Okay. So essentially it's being named the way it comes from base space. It will try to compare your expression values to body atlas. And it, I'm happy to see that you're seeing a lot of brain uh, body parts show up because it's brain versus UHR. Uh, disease is not very meaningful because we're doing some ra random arbitrary co comparison. So uh, it's interesting to see brain cancer though because we're using brain sample and cancer cell line. So hey. That's pretty <laughs> interesting. It also is trying to correlate with uh, a lot of people have done uh, exposure experiments where cell lines have been exposed to different chemical compounds and the expression has been measured. So that's a pharmacoatlas <coughs> that's being correlated. Uh, there's massive project in the way where individual genes are being knocked out. So a knocked down atlas as well. Um, pathway enrichment is not as not a strong suit of uh, next bio. I'm, I'm, I'm honest about that. But uh, nevertheless, we're doing some sort of uh, over-representation analysis as well. What is really interesting, though, is that it does this most correlated curated studies. And as it turns out, obviously, it's most correlated to itself. But right second to it are the same samples all the way back from the MacQC consortium. So it finds the data sets that were generated by the MacQC consortium and says this is the most correlated data sets uh, between them. You can actually select this data set and your own data set do some meta-analysis, but I don't have really time to uh, um, um, show you that. So this is uh, the bio sets, uh, there's <coughs> brain versus UHR, we can add that. And now meta-analysis should become available. Um, and now you're actually doing overlap analysis between two different radical and an expression array and an RNA-seq experiment. Yeah, I know because uh, you know I'm you're, you're looking at my account, and uh, uh, I think a lot of public uh, uh, universities might actually have already a free account at Next Bio. Uh, I think it's maybe five hundred or a thousand dollars per year per per person if you wanted to get one. I think it comes in a package of five, so it's uh, five for five thousand or twenty five. Uh, sorry, 50, 50 years uh, accounts for 25,000. So that's sort of uh, the price point of next bio research. Um, uh, but yeah, so I'm sorry. Th this one I can just show you what, what's in my account. Um, the other thing, though, that is accessible to you is uh, a third party app that does something very similar to Ingenuity, which is called My Pathway Guide. Uh, it's a company out of Michigan, uh, Advaita, that I'm uh, pretty impressed of what, they, what they're doing. 
And there you can click on the link and explore the report, uh, which means that we're looking now at a pathway impact analysis of my differentially expressed genes, gene list that I submitted to, to Advita. Um, the important thing to note is that everybody in the world is doing over-representation analysis, which means which functions in my gene list are overrepresented compared to the whole genome, um, and that's this dimension. <coughs> but Advita also is using your actual expression values, meaning your fold changes and your Q values, to calculate how much impact uh, or perturbed a particular pathway is. So anything that is truly enriched should show up in both dimensions, overrepresented and perturbed, and that's really what you're seeing here. Neuroactive ligand receptor interaction, there should be a glutamatergic uh, uh, synapse. So this makes perfect sense. Again, these are all brain-related pathways. Non-specific would be a ribosome and uh, adhesion molecules. So it's, uh, it's another way of uh, doing over-representation, either uh, the old-fashioned way with you know, over-representation analysis or with the more sophisticated math models, where they, what they're calling perturbation. I think that is somewhere here. Yes, so there's a, there are these little icons. They actually have a nice description in, in the form of videos of what's going on here. I don't have, again, time to really go into much of details. I'm just going to show you if you're clicking on these biological pathways, do the maturity of synapse, you're actually getting a pretty, uh, pretty picture of uh, uh, you know, uh, the synapse, where the different genes fall into in a structural way, how they are upregulated, uh, downregulated, and how a pathway is being impacted. So it's a very powerful way of actually figuring out what your differential gene expression means on a functional level. Uh, and I think this is available for human, mouse, and rat as well. All right, that's it for RNA-seq analysis. Any questions about that? Ah, not too shabby. <laughs> Time-wise. Uh, so let's... Uh, so, and, uh, so this is what I did last year already at this course, but uh, because now I also have a, a metagenomics workshop, I really was trying to showcase some of those capabilities uh, uh, in base space as well. So if you skip in your PDF all the way to page, uh, let's see. So everything that I did right now in this hands-on portion, I really tried to uh, capture most of these steps in the form of screenshots. So there's probably like 60 or 70 pages of just screenshots of what I just did in, in a very high speed fashion. So if you got lost and you really want to do this on your own, uh, explore the different functionalities, this would be your guide for RNA-seq analysis. Uh, uh, same way. You notice I mean, most of the same content uh, that I did in the hands-on. I even put some more slides from the uh, next bio as well. Uh, I pathway guide, etc. <clears throat> okay, metagenomics library prep considerations. And again, I, I'm trying to keep this fairly brief just so that we get a chance to maybe uh, kick up. It, does everybody get a, get a chance to subscribe to BaseSpace by now or we uh, have somebody who is still waiting for some email confirmations going on? We're good? Awesome. So then we can do another project maybe a little bit more hands-on that way. All right, <clears throat> really at high level, when you're doing metagenomic analysis, you really have two fundamental choices. Do you want to do some sort of enrichment or targeting, or do you want to do a shotgun metagenomics approach? Um, uh, and uh, enrichment is typically more than just, your options are bigger than just having 16S sequencing. We're considering if you're, for instance, taking the uh, long terminal repeats of uh, viruses as your target ampl amplification targets, uh, that's considered uh, essentially metagenomic uh, enrichment as well. Um, you obviously need some sort of sequence conservation, um, and uh, it's really the most effective use of sequencing coverage, um, you know, for any given uh, uh, sample. Um, the uh, you know the uh, because you're targeting, especially with 16S, only a sub portion uh, of an, of a genome. Your level of sensitivity is, is definitely limited uh, to uh, best case scenario, maybe a strain level distinction, sorry, a, a species level distinction, and strain uh, separation is typically not possible with 16S. If you want to uh, distinguish very closely related uh, strains or s isolates, you would have to go with the whole genome shotgun metagenomics approach. Um, some people have gone the DNA route. Uh, some people are actually preferring RNA, shotgun metagenomics. It's really up to what you're looking for. 
Um, the nice thing of going the RNA route is that uh, you can actually capture everything. RNA viruses, every other DNA organism has to go through an RNA phase for the expression. So if all you want to know is uh, capture the most diversity, RNA is probably going to be a better bet. We also now have uh, enrichment-based uh, 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 hybridization-based enrichment available for metagenomics. Uh, I think I have a, a slide later on, but I think that's going to be a, a game changer for uh, viral uh, research in that you can design enrichment panels and simply pull out an entire virome uh, out of a very complex sample, uh, a human uh, clinical sample. And I, one of the uh, uh, demo projects uh, shows a beautiful demonstration of the power of this approach for the Lassa virus from, tr uh, from true clinical samples. Um, this is my uh, one-stop shop to pros and cons with three different uh, uh, approaches. I really wanted to point out that 16S analysis uh, benefits from our longest read lengths, uh, which means either MySeq 2x300, 2x250, or HiSeq 2500 with the rapid running mode at 2x250. Um, you can obviously run it on the next seek with 2x150 as well, uh, but as I said, uh, you really gain some sensitivity by having longer read length. Um, for metagenomic shotgun, uh, really all read lengths are pretty much uh, <coughs> useful. Uh, most of the analysis is done uh, nowadays with KMER based enrichment, so the read length is, is not really relevant because you, you use much shorter KMERs for the analysis anyways. The biggest challenge for 16S an uh, analysis are actually chimeras that form during the PCR amplification reaction. So you are creating molecules that do not exist in, in your sample which confound your analysis. So you have a number of algorithms that are designed to identify chimeras and throw them out. Um, the other problem with uh, 16S is that uh, your sequencing errors uh, essentially lead to a false overestimation of diversity. Um, so as you're sequencing deeper and deeper into your sample, uh, you're bound to have, uh, uh, just by random chance, by, by variability of your sequencing quality, uh, finding sequencing reads that look different from anything in the database. So you have two options how to interpre interpret that. Either you say like, oh, I found something really novel and rare, or no, this is a, 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 this is a sequencing error that I need to ignore. Unfortunately, there's no <coughs> good way of just simply taking uh, one sample and saying this is a sequencing error versus a uh, novel molecule. You can use the Q values, of course, uh, but uh, it's much better to try to uh, eliminate these sequencing errors through some sort of consensus approach. And uh, let me just quickly jump to that approach because uh, that's essentially what uh, this publication is about. Uh, they're doing a full length 16S analysis by doing a first strand synthesis. Actually, let me switch to presentation mode so it's easier to see. Yeah, I apologize, I should have done this a while back. Um, where they're essentially adding a 10 nucleotide randomer on your first strand synthesis. They're following this with a second strand synthesis and another 10 mer randomer. So they're getting this full 1.5 kb amplicon. Uh, it amplified this in bulk. And then uh, they are using uh, uh, Nextera XT, which uh, tagments these, uh, these fragments and breaks them up into smaller portions. And you're getting three different populations. You're getting unfragmented uh, full-length 16S. You're getting uh, pieces where you only see one randomer and uh, the insert sequence, some, some place of the insert. And then you see the other randomer and uh, another portion of the insert. So you're using these uh, unfragmented to build buckets, essentially, where you're deciding this molecule has these two bonecular barcodes. You map these guys back to their respective buckets and you're ending up with a nice consensus sequence uh, that covers the full length of the uh, 16S molecule. So uh, there's really only one downside to this approach. You have to obviously sequence much deeper to doing this, but the gain in sensitivity and the ability to uh, wash out any sequencing errors <coughs> are quite phenomenal, and they're making a, a big deal out of it, saying is that uh, typical 16S analysis does typically overestimate diversity due to the fact of not being able to distinguish uh, sequencing errors. Um, uh, yeah, so I do have a quick a reminder how the uh, uh, 16S protocol actually works. You have your locus specific sequences, you have your little overlap adapters, you do a second round of PCR where you're adding 
uh, indices and your sequencing primers, everything gets cleaner in between and that's your final library. We do have a step-by-step uh, -step, uh, um, protocol that is available to download, the link is right here. And I just want to show you which uh, applicant we're targeting uh, in this protocol. There's also a link to a, a website here that will evaluate your primer pair of how much uh, sequencing diversity could be captured uh, with, with this primer pair. And yeah, I think this is pretty much all that I want to say as intro to 16S. And let's see if the next step is the... Uh, ah, okay, so next step is just to show, tell you what the apps uh, uh, that are available to, for 16S analysis are in, in base space. And it's primarily three. We have uh, the uh, 16S metagenomics app that uh, people are already familiar with from MySeq Reporter that now became a, a base based app. Uh, but we also have access to Kraken metagenomics, my personal favorite, uh, and uh, Chime as well. Uh, Chime is actually two apps. One is a pre-processing step and one is a visualization uh, app which uh, does a great job of uh, producing pretty pictures about your 16S data, uh, how they classify and how they cluster. It's, it's pretty neat. I wanted to point out that there's two more apps for metagenomic analysis, which is Metaflang and Genius. Uh, they do not work for 16S data analysis just because 16S sequences are not part of their respective databases. All right, so they are specifically designed to analyze bacterial genomes uh, outside of their 16S sequence. Um, the, uh, yeah, so this is the, uh, the project that I want you to uh, um, uh, download or, or, or accept shared. So this is again a Google uh, URL, small p, capital Z, little w, o, zero, two. I'll give everybody a second to type this in. And while you type this in, I'm just telling you a little bit, well, actually I already uh, mentioned it earlier, is that uh, this Japanese group uh, was interested in expanding the diversity estimation to Archi uh, sequences on top of the bacterial sequences. So um, they really uh, uh, did, I think, a great job. And uh, the paper doesn't really show anything novel in the uh, um, you know, results, but it's pretty impressive how well this new primer pair um, <coughs> correlates to qPCR and a number of other quality uh, control metric steps um, in the in you know in, in the data set. Uh, anybody still needs to see the uh, um, the URL? If not, okay, cool. Then uh, let's have a quick look. Yes. You said you had like uh, hybridization capture probes. <coughs> This as well, rather than just primer pairs. We'll, we'll do this in a second later. Okay. Yeah. That's coming in the viral project. Yeah. But yes, we'll talk about the hybridization capture as well. This is strictly 16S, just a brand new 16 uh, primer pair that I'm pretty impressed uh, of its performance. Actually, you know what? Let me show you how well it performs. So these are some uh, 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 captures from the from the publication um, and uh, what was the? Oh, you were asking which. Uh, which targets were, uh, let me see, I, I'm not sure if I can read the, uh, the abstract right here. Uh, no, I'm not, yeah, can't read it, uh, but the paper's right there. Yeah. So uh, it, that certainly will tell you. I, I, I'm pretty sure it's uh, V3, V4, uh, but uh, you can certainly uh, you know, check that uh, in, in the publication. But here they just did some head-to-head uh, -head comparison with uh, a qPCR of the th there's three different pig samples with pig intestines. Um, they also compare it to uh, uh, archi specific primers, so it's, it's performing quite nicely. Uh, and now let's have a look at the, uh, the results. And um, you all should be able to uh, essentially see this in your own uh, uh, account now. Um, we're first going to look at the uh, metagenomics results. I just wanted to point out that uh, we also have a uh, sequencing read archive importer. So if you do read the paper, it's like, ah, I wonder what this data looks like. You can actually import that data into your base base account simply by punching in uh, your SRA uh, account, uh, access accession number, which I did here. Uh, but uh, I'm going to skip over that. We're just going to look at the 16S metagenomics results. Uh, first step is that uh, if you're looking at your aggregate summary now, uh, you see all of these different uh, output files in the form of CSV files at the different phylogenetic levels. So 
you're getting a nice output for all of your uh, results at the different phylogenetic level. And I think I just simply grab the class level CSV file, uh, and there's your methano brevibacter uh, results. I think, let me see where's the. Uh, and the important thing here is that uh, that's the R key specific that is highly enriched in the in this in these pig intestines. But if you're doing a, an R key specific uh, primer pair, you clearly overrepresent the sequence, and you're getting a false sense of abundance. Uh, what the R key uh, essentially contribute to the sample. Now, if you're going with the historic bacterial uh, uh, primer, you don't see it at all. I mean, these are you know zero percent uh, abundance in the bacterial primer pair, so you don't see R keys in this. But then, with the new universal prokaryotic primer, you're getting 1.9 percent, 1.1 percent. I don't know. I think it's like somewhat three percent. And you're really getting a, a much better sense of where the R keys are relative to the bacteria as part of your sample. So I think uh, just from that point of view, it's, it's a very, uh, very useful new <coughs> primer pair for 16S analysis. Um, the other thing is that you can do yourself, you can, again, we're still in the aggregate summary, uh, you can go to the principal co coordinate analysis portion and start uh, turning this lever uh, into in, you know, lower and lower phylogenetic uh, um, levels. And as you do that, you are seeing how these different samples separate quite nicely. And uh, again, what's, what's really impressive is that clearly each one of these pigs has their own unique uh, intestinal flora. So that's not a big surprise. What really came as a surprise to me is how well those uh, three different primer pairs preserve the uh, information content between the different uh, uh, samples. So each, each pig has their own sort of pattern that is nicely preserved. The relative orientation of these uh, samples uh, versus the different primer pairs is preserved. So it's just that species level PCOA is, is really most infor informative, but it really speaks to the power of doing 16S analysis for comparing uh, populations to each other, bacterial populations to each other. Um, I'm now doing some sort of integrated visualization in that I wanted to know how well does Kraken perform uh, versus uh, uh, the 16 s metagenomics app. So right here you're seeing the uh, sunburst chart as it's being generated by the uh, 16S analysis app. And this is the sunburst chart by the Kraken metagenomics app. And they look on the high level quite similar. But if you notice, if you hover over this portion, it says unassigned methanobrevibacter, which tells me that it's the R key portion of the 16S database, green gene database, is not well explored and it's, it's, it's very high level. On the, on the other end, Kraken database literally gets you methanobrevibacter, uh, can't read it, uh, Smithy? I don't know what this is. Uh, anyway, so it gets you the full strain identification with ATCC accession number. So that just, I'm not saying that they are better algorithms, I'm just saying that the, uh, the database for Kraken is much more descriptive, much more specific uh, compared to the uh, uh, database in the metagenomics app. So my, my number one default choice is always to use the Kraken app for any sort of metagenomic analysis. Um, yeah. And the same is certainly, what is interesting though is that the quantitation is extremely uh, conserv consistent. So this one is 14% uh, and it's rounded to a whole percent. This one is 14.1%. So the actual quantitation of the underlying data is very, very well preserved regardless of the two different approaches, which is nice to know. And uh, you can cl clearly see that this is true for all the other pigs as well. All right, um, any more questions about 16S metagenomics? No, okay, fantastic. So let's look at the uh, viral metagenomics. And it is based on RNA access. So we are making a cDNA of, of our entire sample but because we can obviously design novel probes against targets that we're interested in, we can fish out any part of that cDNA that we want to. And as a proof of concept, uh, Illumina R&D essentially decided that they wanted to design probes, and you can see them right here, those little purple dots, are probes tiling the entire uh, HPV genome or adenovirus uh, genome as well. Uh, both of these strains are actually part of the human genome. They are in particular uh, cell lines, they're integrated. So they are there at a stable concentration, but in a very low abundance. So when they did sequence this on a, on a MySeq, 
uh, they noticed that uh, they can get, uh, and it's hard to see, over 700 fold, 200, 300 fold, and almost, 100, almost 200 fold enrichment of doing total RNA seq versus this uh, RNA access enrichment of these viral particles. So it's really a specific design to fish out very rare sequences out of the sea of a host. Uh, host sequences, uh, which really helps you transition uh, viral diagnostics from a high seq uh, total RNA seq protocol to a my seq based uh, RNA access based protocol. But you have to know the sequence. Hmm? You have to know the virus. Absolutely. Uh, uh, the good thing is, though, is that uh, I think we've done the math. If you were to combine every single known uh, viral sequence, uh, known to man, I think you end up sort of with a 37 megabase, literally like an exome size. The human exome is about the same size as the known virome. So you could theoretically design a, a pan-virome panel that targets every known viral sequence uh, uh, in the world. And the good thing with, uh, uh, with hybridization capture is that you only need about an 80% uh, uh, homology to fish something out that is quite divergent from a known sequences. So, I give you that, you probably won't find radically new viruses that have not ever been seen and they're in no database. But if it's just somewhat related to a, to a known virus, I think 80% homology is going to go a long way of fishing it out and finding it. Is, it. is there a difference between virus that was just present in your sample and virus that's integrated into the genome? In this case, yes, because if it's integrated into the genome but transcriptionally inactive, you won't see it. Because remember, this is cDNA based. We're making, we're converting all available RNA into uh, a cDNA. So to, in order to catch, capture RNA uh, viruses, and of course, DNA virus that make uh, that are actively uh, transcribing. But that, my one caveat is that it's not actively transcribing, you won't catch it. Okay? Is there a bacterial version of this? Um, so, so let me rephrase that. This requires access to our concierge team. So if you have a target sequence that you can think of, you can provide us with that uh, genome sequence and we'll design the, uh, the, the tiling uh, probe, synthesize them, and provide you with a, with, an, uh, with a target pool that you simply plug into RNA access uh, product off the shelf. You're just simply exchanging the, uh, the probe pool to your target region and uh, you're good to go. Uh, it just requires that you uh, contact your local uh, account manager and they'll put you in contact with the concierge team. How much does that cost? Um, I, don't, I, I honestly, I don't know what the premium is to get these things synthesized, but I do know that we have two levels of, of concierge service. One is simply design and synthesis and here you go. But we even offer uh, a, a level two concierge service where we do functional testing on our end uh, and we have seen that uh, the typical charge, if your project is large enough and of high enough strategic value, we could even waive the, uh, the concierge fee uh, as well. So it's really... It's not waived. How many did it? That's what I'm saying. I, I, I don't... It really depends how big your pro pool is. Um, it's, you know, if, you, if you do a small panel, it's going to be cheaper than doing that panviral panel which targets 37 megabases. Um, we have this panviral panel? asking for it. I would love to have it off the shelf. I completely agree and I was like, and we've done the exercise. I think we have collected all these viral genomes, but uh, I think at this point, we, and I think this is the next slide, we only, this is the one that we're willing to show where we targeted uh, uh, um, uh, replicating respiratory viruses. So this is, this is one panel targeting these different viruses, but uh, Yes, I would love to see a pan-viral panel as, as an off-the-shelf product uh, uh, because once we we we, uh, we synthesize in bulk, you know, the, we can make it pretty you know, pretty cost-effective. And of course, getting a hundred-fold enrichment, uh, you know, really helps you out in either transitioning into smaller sequencing boxes or uh, you know having to sequence much uh, in much fewer reads per sample. This one is. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, it's actually, this is uh, 24 uh, samples on one MySeq run. So this is essentially only one million reads per sample, and we can, we can capture all of these viruses quite nicely from just one million reads. 
Um, yeah, so what are the, what, what is, so this is the, uh, these are the apps available for viral analysis. Kraken has virus sequences as part of their genome. Uh, it has 70,000 influenza isolates in there. It's pretty crazy. Uh, we have PathSeq Virum, that's a third party app that simply checks for 50,000 human pathogenic uh, viruses. But it, all it gives you back is a PDF report, no, no actual hard data. Uh, my mind, not, not particularly useful. So, this is the one from Nathan Madison? The PathSeq? No, PathSeq I think comes from uh, um, Singapore. It's a third party app from the Singapore uh, research group. Um, and uh, DeepCheck, this is a commercial provider where you will provide them with the HIV, HCV, and HPV sequencing information, and that one tries to figure out how the variants influence, potentially influence uh, drug treatment. It is RUO, but it's going pretty far in, in making recommendations and at least uh, providing guidance in how uh, virus uh, mutations might impact uh, drug treatments or escapes of, that, of such resistance. Um, I did try to collect a couple more publicly available tools, but they're not on base base. Um, so this is the uh, this is the project uh, that I want you to uh, uh, accept next. So this is uh, again G O O G L, two small L's, capital E, two U's, and a capital T. Um, so again, while you while you type this, I'm just wanted to tell you a little bit more about this project. This this data set comes from the Broad. Um, they went out uh, obviously with the big Ebola outbreak uh, into Africa. They also collected Lassa samples from uh, Lassa virus. Uh, I'm sorry, Lassa fever patients from one of these clinics, and uh, their their standard operating protocol was to do an RNA uh, ribosomal RNA depletion protocol. So deplete your ribosomal RNA, sequence everything else. But it turns out that's not very effective in capturing those viral sequences because they're just so rare, uh, even with a fully infected human, which is quite surprising that there is actually not that much virus even in a, in a fully uh, uh, Lassa uh, fever outbreak. Anyway, so they decided as they learned more about their Lassa isolated Lassa virus as well, why don't we design exactly like that? An enrichment, hybridization-based enrichment panel against Lassa virus, only Lassa virus. Uh, and then they compared this directly to their uh, ribosomal depletion uh, uh, results. Everybody else still, anybody else still needs to uh, type this? Everybody good? All right, so this is essentially what they ended up doing. <coughs> they, uh, uh, you know, Lassa virus, just to give you a sort of a point of reference, hemorrhagic fever with high morbidity rate, no treatment options, it's a single-strand RNA virus, has two segments, 7.4 kb and 3.4 kb. Each segment has just two proteins that it expresses. Uh, it's quite impressive how four proteins can be so devastating. It's a BSL-4 reagent. Um, and what they found out actually is as you're transitioning uh, viral detection from uh, a qPCR to next-gen sequencing, this becomes actually quite a bit of a problem because most of the viral uh, 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 sample processing kits contain poly-A RNA as carrier RNA and uh, that's not a problem if you do qPCR because you're targeting your virus, no big deal. But as you're sequencing, you don't want to be sequencing all these poly-A uh, uh, you know, carrier RNA that, that, that your kit introduces. So they actually uh, switched to a uh, uh, depletion strategy as the part of their uh, depletion of ribosomal RNA uh, uh, strategy. Uh, if they're removing the host RNA by RNA's age, uh, they're getting about a five-fold viral enrichment versus just a pure total RNA. Uh, they're seeing many other non-host reads from other infections of the patient. So this is an African patient, so of course they've been exposed to quite a number of uh, 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 you know, viruses. And from about five million reads, they're getting one, less than one X coverage of the Lassa viral. This is about 10 kb target sequence and they're getting less than 1x coverage from 5 million reads. So this is not, not particularly effective. Then they also designed this enrichment panel that they did 72 hours hybridization against the 100 mer Pro. They're getting about a 75 fold enrichment. Still not great, but definitely much improved over this. And from 1.2 million reads, they're getting about a 10x LASA coverage. And 10x is really what you at least need to do de novo assembly, a variant calling, etc. It's really the absolute baseline uh, for this sort of work. Um, and as you're looking at this, uh, at this uh, data set, I think I just showed you how to submit 
um, the, to the Kraken app. Again, you're selecting your two samples. This is pre-populated. Um, because it's a human sample, you can actually choose to uh, do a subtraction against the human gene. <coughs> so what that does is, these data sets, as they are in SRA, of course have their human reads supposedly already removed. That's just part of the uh, submission protocol to SRA. Um, but we can still nevertheless look if we can find some additional human reads. Um, you can also su uh, submit fast A files to Kraken, and this we're going to explore later when we're submitting the, uh, the Novo assembly to see if we have spurious the Novo assembly uh, as well. So you can actually upload fast A files to base, uh, to base space through a fast A up uh, uploader app, and then run your uh, uh, Kraken app over this. Uh, we are using the mini Kraken database. Uh, the Salzburg lab actually has at least two databases. They have a Kraken and a mini Kraken. The difference is the full Kraken database is much larger and it actually includes uh, eukaryotic sequences as well. Uh, so the mini Kraken is strictly, it has about four million uh, uh, isolates in there and it has uh, um, you know, only bacterial, archaea, and viral sequences. No eukaryotes. Um, yeah, so it's a base-based lab stack. That means that we'll put a little disclaimer at the bottom that you have to acknowledge, etc. So once you kick this off and we're looking at the results, again, I'm staying in the PowerPoint presentation, but you can certainly look at the results uh, at your own leisure. This is essentially screen grabs from the output files. The uh, ribodepleted uh, gives you about 1.6% uh, of classified reads. So there's a lot of unclassified reads still in there. This one gets you, um, what's it called, 17% uh, classification. So that's uh, already much improved. But uh, more importantly, as you're looking at these results with the Kraken app again, you're getting, you, you know exactly how many reads map to your virus. So it's 43 reads for the uh, rival depleted. That's how I got to this 0.8 to 1x coverage, genome coverage. And uh, the hybridization one gives you about 500 reads uh, out of 1.2 million, um, which gives you about 14 to 20 x uh, genome coverage. So you're getting about a 75-fold enrichment of hybridization versus uh, simply depletion. Uh, we're looking at some of the output files that the Kraken app uh, produces. So this is this this is the, this output file. In this in the rival depleted, you can really make a, a, an appreciation for all the different human pathogenic uh, virus that are being uh, uh, shown in this sample. Uh, if you go in with the hybridization, the list is much shorter, and you can see there's your um, Lassa virus. It also is quite shocking because you can look at the whole output file, and I just you know, zoomed in on the viruses, that there are only two Lassa isolates available in the database. So if you want to know what's in the database, you can simply, instead of downloading the summary TSV file, you just simply uh, download the entire Kraken report file, and that one has literally every single uh, uh, target genome in the list available, its individual code, and also how many reads map to that particular, um, that particular uh, target. And it's quite shocking that there's only two Lassa isolates available in that Kraken database, really speaking to the difficulty of, uh, of working with these highly contagious and dangerous uh, viruses. Um, the uh, uh, next thing that I sh wanted to try out is that, well, what happens if I try to de novo assemble this metagenomic sample? And because it's an enriched sample, it's not uh, uh, technically a uh, true metagenomic de novo assembly. It's really like, will the, micro will the viral reads find each other? And uh, I'm doing a genome assembly of the virus out of a metagenomic sample. So I'm using the uh, spades de novo assembler for that. Spades is uh, probably one of the very best uh, uh, short read assembler out there. Uh, it was designed to work with really uh, dramatically different uh, abundances because it's designed to work with a uh, single uh, cell amplified, MDA amplified bacterial reads. So it's, it's probably the most robust de novo assembler as well. So if you're sh shooting some really unique data sets uh, for de novo assembly, Spades probably would be your best bet. Uh, in that sense. You can actually specify what sort of data you have, library type pair then, mate pair, what's the orientation of your read. So you can really fine tune your recipe of what it is, what how your data actually looks like. Um, you have choice between error correction and assembly, only error correction or only assembly. 
and you can choose if it's a multi-cell or a uh, MDA amplified single cell. Um, you can actually choose the, the KMERS as well, but uh, auto seems to produce uh, quite robust results. Um, yeah, so if we're now looking at the space results uh, for the two samples, the uh, RIBO depleted, I mean, we have less than 1x coverage, no surprise, we don't get long context, very fragmented. If we go with the hybridization, look at that, we're getting 7.3, and if we're looking actually at the output file, 7.3, KB and 3.3 KB, exactly what uh, we were expecting for that viral assembly. The next thing we can do, we can actually go into uh, uh, what is called uh, Kraken. Again, now we're submitting these de novo assemblies to Kraken again, because I was curious, well, how fragmented are these assemblies? So now we're classifying these two contigs, and there's eight contigs in the uh, 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 RNA-seq ribodepleted uh, assembly that map back to Lassa virus but only two reads, exactly those two contexts that we're talking about, uh, that come back as Lassa virus uh, uh, origin. So that tells us that it's, it's a complete de novo assembly of the virus, there are no spurious other uh, contexts floating around, and really showcasing the power of getting just 10x coverage for the virus, uh, how much you can do with that already with spades. Um, the next thing you can do is you can take the de novo assembly and run it through an a open reading finder uh, gene annotation pipeline, which is called PROCA. Uh, and PROCA, again, you are selecting the context, and uh, uh, the output is, is quite uh, qu quite fantastic. So it looks for tRNAs, how many cDNAs it finds, CRISPR elements, rRNA, tRNAs, etc. Uh, but when I open up these files, it's, it's, I, was, I was just elated to see that, that Again, here are my two contexts, the uh, uh, 7.4 and the 3.3, and I'm literally getting all four proteins complete, no frame shifts, because I can see that the uh, length of the open reading frames are pretty much spanning the entire open reading frame, I'm sorry, the entire uh, um, uh, contig, and uh, they are all, except for this hypothetical protein, which probably the function is not assigned yet, but they all map to the arena virus, uh, either RNA polymerase, the glycoprotein, or the nucleic capsid protein, without me having to tell anything. It's just like, here's my assembly, find me my own reading frames, and classify them. So, uh, totally reference-free, uh, and uh, you can you know, now go, and this is probably a pretty decent discovery pipeline for novel um, functionalities. Um, let's see. Path, yeah, so how does PathSeq virome perform? Again, not particularly impressive because ultimately all you're getting is this. Two PDF reports with an arbitrary score uh, on, from green to red. I mean, it's nice and colorful, but uh, it really does not really give you any quantitative information besides that, you know, uh, the score of how well it can find these two different viruses. It does find both uh, the, the Lassa viruses, but uh, uh, what we can do with Kraken is much more impressive than uh, what you can do with past sig virome. All right. Yes, we actually do have uh, uh, 10 more minutes that I can uh, give you a quick uh, rundown what you what uh, I, I consider is useful for <laughs> microbial analysis as well. Um, so these are, we already seen most of these guys. I talked about them, 16 s genomics, obviously Kraken, uh, Genius, and Metaflan. Really, what their pros, you know, what their pros and cons are. Uh, Proca, I showed. Uh, I wanted to just point out that SRST2. If all you want to do is you have multiple microbial outbreaks and you want to do some uh, multi-locus sequence typing, you can use the uh, MRST2 app. Uh, but as you notice, I'm going to find out in just about a second, is that uh, MLST is just very poor substitute to do a whole genome analysis uh, for tr uh, strain tracking. It just doesn't have the resolution that you have available with full genome annotation. These are the three de novo assembler apps that we have in base space. We have Velvet. Uh, Velvet is probably the best bet if you have many, many uh, microbial genes that have to be processed in parallel, because Velvet submits all of these different uh, samples in parallel to, to the cloud. So 96 samples are gonna take, you know, again, just however your smallest sample is gonna perform. Spades gives you the most granularity, how you want, what you want to feed into your de novo assembly. You can exactly specify is it a mate pair, is it <coughs> uh, the orientation as well. And of course, it's designed for even single cell amplified data as well. 
Uh, I'm happy to see that we have uh, String Graph Assembler as an app as well. And it's designed to uh, cover all, you know, maybe a gigabase uh, target size genomes. But uh, with this haploid uh, human, uh, I was able to go all the way to four gigabases. Uh, a genome that was, was estimated at five or six gigabases, uh, you know, base base crashed. So um, as you're approaching larger and larger data sets, uh, SGA may or may not uh, work. Um, but it did work for a haploid human, and uh, it's pretty much designed to 500 megabases, maybe one gigabase as uh, genome size. It does take two libraries in, so you can do a paired end library and a mate pair library, and uh, have one continuous uh, de novo assembly available. Um, just coming back to this microbial example, so this is an outbreak from uh, NICU. Uh, neonatal uh, intensive care unit where you had a MRSA outbreak strain, uh, uh, which is uh, uh, Staphylococcus, multi-drug resistant uh, uh, Staphylococcus aureus outbreak. And they did a retrospective study where they used uh, seven outbreak strains and seven unrelated strains. If you, you know, this is sort of the timeline, it spanned many, I mean like a hundred days. Uh, they actually had to shut down the NICU for, for a couple of times. So this was a pretty severe uh, outbreak. Uh, and uh, if you're looking now here from the, uh, from the initial outbreak to when the actual detection of, uh, of, of uh, MRSA was found to the actual bacteriemia outbreak, that was a very long stretch of time. They could never cure this poor little kid or uh, infant from uh, the, the MRSA infection it had until you know, the, the, the bacteriemia actually broke out. Uh, there were transmission events to other infants, so it's, it's a pretty dire situation. Uh, anyway, so when we're doing MLST analysis on these 14 samples, you notice that, uh, yes, some of these can be distinguished, uh, but some of these supposedly unrelated strains are cl clustering just the same with the outbreak strains. So obviously that's not very informative. Uh, what I then did, uh, I actually ran the uh, original sample against the Kraken uh, metagenomic uh, tool to, to find out what's the closest related uh, genome sequence in my sample, which is you know, Staphylococcus aureus, but this particular outbreak. And it turns out that was exactly the same that was found as a reference strain in the publication, but I found it independently with Kraken. Um, then I can... Uh, okay, no, we don't want this. Ah, bad timing. Wow, that was a bit, that was pretty cool. <laughs> right where I stopped, right? Something happened. Yes, wow, right where I stopped. Um, anyway, so then I used the Velvet app to simply de novo assemble those 14 uh, strains. And if you notice closely, here you're actually seeing the different times that were required. I think the longest one was 30 minutes, the shortest about seven minutes uh, for these Velvet assemblies. But the nice thing is it was also this uh, parallel execution, so it was done in half an hour. Uh, each one of these strains gives you these uh, contact and uh, um, scaffold uh, uh, um, graphs, like how, how fragmented uh, is the assembly. But the nice thing is I could then simply download all of the fast A files of the assembly and I su submitted it to a, a third party tool. It's not in base space, but it's, a, it's an openly available uh, tool which is called RealFi, which is out of Switzerland. Uh, and RealFi simply takes in fast A files, the Novo assemblies, and builds a nice unsupervised uh, uh, tree. Um, if I do all of my 14 samples, uh, you know, all of my outbreak strains are clustering together, which is good because it really showcases, uh, you know, how well the resolution is. But if you now only submit these guys separately, you're generating a tree that is actually quite similar to this. What's coming from the publication? Uh, if you notice this uh, sample six. It's the same sample six that is producing this longer arm uh, in the uh, uh, in this uh, in this tree. These people had to define a core genome uh, uh, out of their uh, out of their reference genome. I simply submitted my de novo assemblies uh, and got to a pretty similar result as well. Um, so this is essentially I'm, I'm talking to the developer. Hopefully we'll have a real fi app next year. Uh, that would be fantastic. Uh, and that's pretty much it. Uh, I do have five minutes more uh, left. Uh, if there are any questions, particular apps that uh, somebody's interested in, uh, I can certainly uh, uh, 
uh, cover some more questions. But uh, thank you very much for your attention, and I hope I uh, showcase base base uh, you know to help you out in the future with your research. Thank you. <laughs> questions? Yes. Um, so it seems like you have a sliding scale to price, um, and I'm not sure what you mean by sliding scale. Well, like that. It, Depending on what you're doing, it goes up in cost, right? Not really. So the base, the base subscription will be free. So you know, there's not going to the base account of base base will have no subscription price attached to it. But you will have to cover your compute costs and your storage costs uh, according to the payments that uh, uh, Amazon requires. So oh, this so is, so it's not a sliding base, scale. It's just so uh, base base. Correct. You're paying okay. Amazon. Oh, exactly. Okay. All right. So um, I, I actually thought that uh, we should give our higher volume customers the enterprise or professional some sort of cost break, or but it turns out we simply opted for an off like uh, throughout same uh, uh, payment scheme so that the, um, the additional functionalities that you are purchasing with a subscription have no influence of what it costs to store and analyze data. So even a base account is is tremendously valuable because. You would have to build this entire infrastructure yourself, figure out a way to consistently pay Amazon anyways. We made that whole process much more seamless and uh, uh, easy for you to, to plan. And, we, and as I said, we are trying to come up with uh, 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 data velocity calculators that will help you uh, figure out how much compute and storage you need to pre-process given the number of samples and the depth of coverage that you are uh, anticipating for your project. Yeah, it seems like it's like a coin base. Yeah, so so the no, so the, the I so yes, you're right. So the I credits actually for there for a different purpose. Some of the third party apps actually require you to pay for the privilege of using their app, and that would come from the from this bucket of. Oh, okay. uh, uh, so if you're just using the, the freeware apps. Then you do not pay for the privilege of using the app. You still have to pay for the compute and the storage. But the app use itself is free. And you pay for that with those little bit or the uh, uh, credits or something. Yeah. <laughs> and then, so are, are you also? I think that you're probably keeping the um, different freeware programs up to date to the newest version. Is that something that? Yeah. So it's it's it's, it's going to be uh, some apps more than others will be on regular upgrade paths. Like for instance, the RNA Seq have been continuously being pushed to be at the forefront of upgrades. Yeah. I would love to see a Kraken updated, the database updated, but I have zero inf in, uh, information of when that uh, might be expected. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's really on an app per apps basis of how the upgrades are being handled. Um, it's really up to somebody literally in Illumina, if it's, if it's an Illumina app, to decide that this, it's now worth it to put out a new version. Um, and essentially, how many users are asking for that particular upgraded functionality? And with RNA seq, it was always like we want to compare multiple samples, not just pairwise. We want more species, so that's coming now. Uh, and, and so we really essentially do what the customers want most. Yeah. And, and so as far as that, so my problem is that I need to, if I'm going to use base space and use the computer power, mm -hmm. I need to have like a cost estimate to my. So that will be part. That will be part of the rollout of that uh, uh, compute. But for now, it's at least it's for now you're paying the bills. Everything. <coughs> so it's pretty easy. So if you get your project finished by March 2016, you're good. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, that was uh, a spot landing 10:30. Thank you very much again and. Uh, um, I think uh, you all have my contact information with the sheet that came with the uh, with the program file. So if you do have individual questions, uh, don't hesitate uh, emailing me. Um, that's what I do. I, I essentially do uh, help customers with experimental design consideration, analysis questions, etc. Um, obviously, there's tech support. Uh, I just wanted to point out that the core apps, the one that doesn't have, that don't have the little Erlmeyer flask in their icons, uh, they are being supported by tech support. All the base base labs apps are essentially you have to send an email to base base labs at illumina.com to get the individual developers uh, to look at your question. Uh, so the, the support path is a little bit slightly different between different app types. And if it's a third party app, it's typically their developers 
um, that are responsible. Just as one final shout out, if you have your own analysis pipeline that you don't want to share with the world, but you want to have your individual uh, organization have access to, you can generate private apps. So you whitelist anybody who can access your, th that uh, analysis. So it's essentially a third party app that only your team can see. And uh, it reduces the support burden and uh, you still utilize all of the underlying platform uh, benefits uh, of base space. No, so, no, for what? For the basics. If it's free to use, we're giving you a terabyte. I'm not sure what you mean. And ultimately, it's just cost pass through for Amazon. So, our our discount is by not charging any sort of profit <coughs> margin on top of that. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. So the on-site system. Uh, if you buy an instrument, I'm sorry, yeah, so the on-site system actually has uh, right now pretty aggressive uh, uh, sales promos in, in place if you were to buy together with the instrument. Uh, everything else you would have to negotiate with your uh, uh, account managers to see what they're willing to, to provide you as a, as a discount. But uh, knowing Illumina, getting, uh, extracting discounts from Illumina is a, uh, is a hard sell. It's tough. <laughs> uh, we're, pretty, we're pretty strict with discounting. Sorry. <laughs> yes. But did you say that the RE6 2.0 mm -hmm. you know, uh, applications are being released? I'm sorry, what? The 2.0 application, the two more versus normal, for example, when did you say they are? So it's there? supposed, I mean, so I already have access to a beta version of that, but uh, it's supposed to come out by the end of the year. So by me having access to a beta version tells me that it's really close to uh, being released. So I wouldn't be surprised if it comes out in the next couple of weeks. So this base. Is um, on the uh, on, on, on site on site systems? So is a computer? Yes. Yeah, so the base space on site system is a, a pretty heavy powered, uh, 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 redundant power supplies and, and back fans, and uh, I think the hard drives are, are, are rated. But the important thing is, it's it's not your off the shelf uh, computer that you min administer yourself. It has essentially the same look and feel as base space cloud except you do get a couple extra functionalities for administrating the box but ultimately you're still doing an app based analysis uh, just like you would be uh, in, in, in base space this is essentially for people who are in clinical environments who can't use the cloud uh, for some other uh, institutional reasons but uh, you essentially and the computer is in those systems so for the closed system, system yes any other correct so just buy one hundred thousand dollar computer for even uh, it's sixty thousand not sure what you mean by hundred thousand. Yeah, like um, for the IC two thousand five hundred. Oh yeah, no, so, right. So there you actually it's two computers. So it's actually two. So it's two. Uh, uh, it's, it's it's and uh, you, you're getting two two boxes when one costs sixty thousand, two is you know a hundred, and you scale this up uh, even for higher for three thousand, four thousand. So Illumina used to have what's called Illumina Compute, which was a cluster that was essentially you had to configure everything yourself. We realized that in order to enable more uh, or less sophisticated with IT infrastructure, we are transitioning essentially everything now to a, a, a base space on site and simply adding up to six uh, uh, of these boxes together, daisy chaining together. But they look like one mm -hmm. continuous interface for you to look at.